Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John, this is Video True Nerd, welcome back to Imperator Rome, which I am saying earlier than I was expecting to for the second time in a row, because let's just go over what's been going on in the background of Imperator Rome, just in case you haven't been following this. So, basically, I think it's fair to say Imperator Rome had a slightly troubled launch. If you go and look at the reviews on Steam right now, it's not the prettiest picture. Bit of a blend of some people feeling there weren't enough features present at launch and some people not being happy with the features that were present. And as a result of that, a roadmap emerged covering the first year of Imperator's life. Now obviously, the big Pompey update we already had. That was a fairly modest one, all things considered. Few decent improvements, especially when it came to naval combat, but nothing too dramatic there in particular. But then we made it to Cicero, which we weren't expecting to arrive until September, but they've just decided you can opt into it now if you want to, though they have one, this is an extremely early version and it's very likely to catch fire, so I'm looking forward to that already. But Cicero, Cicero's the big one, because when I think about big changes in Paradox games, I think back to Stellaris. Now, I remember Stellaris 2.0 that accompanied Apocalypse and 2.2 that accompanied Megacorps, and I think those were pretty damn big changes to the core game of Stellaris. But Cicero blows all of that out of the water. Cicero has basically taken huge piles of the core fundamental building blocks of Imperator Rome and totally changed it. And uh, it's some pretty exciting stuff, actually. It's really moving in the right direction, I think. And when I say this is an early version, yeah, they've really let us into this one early. We're talking about missing graphics not yet completed, uh, missing picture, missing picture, load of missing graphics over here as well. Yeah, this is a really, really early sneak peek. But let's start off with the big one up at the top there. You may notice that the old power currencies, sometimes called monarch powers or mana, are now gone. Military power, finesse, oratory power, religious power, they are just gone from the game. And that is a massive change because they did pretty much everything in Imperator Rome when the game first came out. So uh, let's talk about how things have changed and more importantly what that means for how the game functions and flows. Because I think this is some really cool stuff right here. So let's start off with military tradition, say. So back when this game first came out, in order to unlock a military tradition, you needed a big old pile of military power. And in terms of how much military power you had, it was overwhelmingly a focus on how good the martial stat of your leader was. Now, there were other ways of earning military power. There was a small amount of base military power everybody got, and if you actually tinkered around with, yeah, the national ideas, you could get yourself a bit of bonus military power together with all of the other currencies as well. But overwhelmingly, if your leader was good at martial, you would get lots of military power. If he was bad at martial, you would get very little military power. Everything was really tied down to the core stats of your leader. But in a world without military power, instead now, you need to actually spend military experience points to unlock all of the traditions. Military experience is calculated in a much more interesting way. So, you get yourself a little bit of military experience each month, but it's modified by a whole bunch of interesting diverse stuff, rather than just, does your leader have a high martial stat, yes or no. So, average cohort experience is a big part of it. Basically, all the armies in your empire, what level of experience are they floating at any given moment? The more experience your troops have, and of course, that's your troops, not mercenary troops, the more military experience points are coming into your empire, the faster you can adopt new military traditions. So right now for me, I'm getting no bonus whatsoever, because my army has literally no experience whatsoever. But if I just engage in a quick war here, that situation changes very rapidly. So I had two forces during this war. One force that was just getting on with doing the sieging. So they picked up a little bit of experience at the beginning of the war, but their experience is only at 19.41% right now. And as you can see, that actually ticks down faster than it used to. I believe it only used to tick down when you actually, yeah, lost battles. These days, it ticks down all the flipping time, just as time goes by, representing people retiring, new people coming in, troops just getting lazy because they're not fighting. I don't know. In general, it's harder to maintain high experience units than it used to be. But this small force of 4,000 over here, that was the light cavalry force I was just chasing down the enemy armies with. So those guys are a much more respectable 72.49% experience. But as you might also be able to see there, yeah, that experience drains away even faster. So it's very difficult to maintain extremely elite troops because when they're not engaged in day-to-day -day battle, they do actually lose their XP nice and fast. However, this actually means there's been a really nice change up here in military experience. So uh, yeah, we were gaining 0.3 just as a base. 
But as a result of the fact my armies right now are super experienced, we've basically doubled that immediately by adding another 0.27 on top because there are so many experienced cavalry dust about. However, if I just get time ticking along here, you'll see as the experience starts to drop away, the amount of military experience I'm gaining on a monthly basis is also accordingly dropping. Now, fundamentally, this is already a really good thing because if nothing else, it makes sense. If your armies are actually going about fighting lots of wars, if lots of your citizens are tied up inside the army, if veterans are a big part of your society, then it makes sense that that society would be a heavily militaristic one, and as a result of that, would be able to pick up military advances faster. So yeah, this makes a lot more sense, rather than just having a king who happens to be into martial stuff. Now, if you want your army to pick up the big military traditions and get stronger faster, you need to actually be, you know, fighting wars, fielding armies, getting lots of experience for them, making sure they're actually fighting day to day. Now that's really cool, but it gets a lot better. You see, the thing about the old system is, having a high martial leader was an unqualified good. It was just a big pile of military power with no actual downside to it. So there was no choice there. Like if you could have a leader who had really high stats, you'd always go for that leader because it was an unqualified good. But the new system is a lot more interesting because now we start getting into choices where you can actually try and speed up your military advancement, but it screws you over in other ways. So there's actually interesting decisions to be made here. So as we've just been saying, you need average cohort experience to be nice and high if you want your military traditions to be coming in nice and fast. But there is one way to keep experience higher than it would be otherwise, and that's the new drill function. Here we go, this lovely button right here. So a standing army can be basically put into drill mode. It makes it much more expensive, but it means it's actually gaining a big old pile of experience. But the other downside, of course, is, yeah, loyalty gain chance goes up. So as a result of that, more troops are going to become more loyal to their generals more often. And uh, loyalty is a much bigger problem than it used to be. We'll get to that in a minute. For the moment, let's just focus on the fact that, yeah, you're actually harming yourself in a couple of ways, paying more out in wages, potentially making troops more loyal to their generals, which can be dangerous in order to actually get their experience up. So on this occasion, yeah, now these guys aren't losing experience anymore. These guys are actually gaining experience as time goes by. And here we go at this point, the experience that's being gained by my main army, First Stratos, is slowly nudging up the average cohort experience of the entire army. In short, I'm now gaining military experience faster. But it gets even more flipping interesting yet. You see, I can also improve the rate of military experience gain by choosing to maintain high war exhaustion. Now, war exhaustion up to this point has basically been pretty much universally a bad thing. You wanted to, yeah, just get rid of that as fast as possible when you got it because it was an unqualified bad. But now, now it's got an upside to it as well. So I'm just going to give myself a little bit of war exhaustion immediately just by, yeah, declaring war on my neighbours without actually having a Kausas Bell Ice. That'll just give me a plus two war exhaustion immediately. So let's just do that just for the sake of, yeah, picking some of that up. There we go. Marvellous. So yeah, that is bad in many ways. National unrest plus two is pretty problematic. Rule of popularity loss, that's never good as well. But... It does have an upside. Monthly military experience up by 2%. Not spectacular to be honest, because yeah, that's a fairly modest benefit. But I like the fact that plenty of systems aren't just now unqualified good or unqualified bad. Instead, lots of stuff have pluses and minuses to them. So you can actually make more interesting tactical decisions about how you want to run your empire. But the big one for me is Mercenary Reliance. Now, this one's really cool, because you may recall by the end of my Ellis playthrough, I was basically running 100% mercenary armies all the time, because mercenary armies are brilliant, it means you're not eating into your own manpower, it means you don't need to worry about attrition of your own men or reinforcements or anything. Mercenaries were just a really damn good way to go. And that was before the Pompey update, the men all mercenary leaders got a permanent plus five to their leadership, so they were even bloody stronger. But now, Mercenary Reliance will really bloody screw you over. So if I just very quickly hire myself the cheapest band of pirates in the world, here we go, you guys seem pretty cheap. We'll just hire ourselves some mercenary fleets, marvellous. So mercenaries are great in this game. Yeah, there's now a really, really damn big downside that comes with maintaining mercenaries. And that's that if your army is primarily made up of mercenaries, you basically lose huge amounts of military experience, and as a result of that, 
can't pick up the military upgrades anymore. So uh, there's a really fascinating, interesting tactical choice to be made as to whether to maintain your own armies or whether to be hiring mercenaries because every moment you've got mercenaries on the field, you are absolutely screwing up your level of military experience gain and thus slowing down your progress towards the traditions. And the traditions are really, really, really damn powerful. These are the biggest, most powerful upgrades in the game. So all of a sudden, you've got some big choices to make. If you hire yourself some mercenaries, sure, those guys will show up with experienced commanders, tons of troops, you don't need to worry about manpower, you can just break them down when you're done. Absolutely flipping magnificent, but you are going to start falling massively behind in military traditions. And instead, if you actually run your own armies, keep them experienced, keep your own citizens in the front line, fighting, being drilled, keeping their experience nice and high, you're going to start getting the big traditions in really, really, really damn fast. So absolutely, it can be difficult to maintain your own army because manpower can be such a problem. But if you do, your army is going to become a ridiculously elite professionalized force that in the long run is probably going to absolutely slaughter mercenaries. Or at least that's one way of looking at it. Alternatively, you could say, hang on, hang on, hang on. What if I just decide to use, you know, my special omens to get the cost of mercenaries down if that's one of the omens you've got access to? What if I decide to focus on technology that gets the cost of mercenaries down? What if I decide to focus on traditions that let me hire mercenaries on the cheap? Sure, the professionalized citizen armies of other nations will be really powerful, but I can just keep flinging mercenaries at them, and in the end, I might be able to win anyway, because mercenary leaders can be so much more strong than typical generals can be. And I don't know who would logically win in that argument. You could argue it both ways, and that's what makes this sort of change really, really, really damn good. It's not about fundamentally getting rid of the monarch powers, it's about the fact that what's replaced them is interesting and tactical and has all sorts of pros and cons to every move you can make. It's really, really, really damn good stuff. And that's just one tiny example in a big update that's full of stuff like that. So that's military experience, but in some ways that kind of is like military power, just renamed and from a different source, because it even does the same things. It unlocks the military traditions, and on top of that, you need to spend a little of it if you're actually going to be hiring mercenaries. So that's another way that mercenaries screw over your progress the next military tradition. You lose 10 military experience every time you hire mercenaries, just as part of the cost of hiring them. But there's one other new currency, and this one's a bit more of an interesting one in some ways. Say hello to political influence. Now, political influence is in some ways kind of a monarch power because, yeah, it's something that you can stockpile over time and then you spend it to do things immediately. However, I think it's going to be one that people have a lot less problems with than they did with, say, charisma or finesse or religious power. Because let's just say there's no risk this one's ever going to be stockpiled because it's very much in demand. And the way it's earned is really interesting as well. So you can see there, you're earning it off all of the members of your government, depending on how loyal they are. So as it ever was, eight key members of your government, they produce, if they're at 100% loyalty, 0.25 per month towards political influence. However, if they're not 100% loyal, then the amount they're producing is reduced by the same percentage. Now, I like this as a system of earning political influence because it makes appointing government ministers more interesting than it used to be. Because when Imperator first came out, you'd pretty much go for whoever had the highest relevant number. But then with the Pompey update, it wasn't always the person with the highest number. It was the person with the best combination of decently high number and good loyalty. And particularly, people who had traits that meant their loyalty would stay high. So people who were naturally content were good picks because their loyalty wouldn't just slip away over time. But now the needle has swung even more towards potentially prioritizing people who have got high loyalty. Because now that high loyalty is also helping you out with one of the most important currencies in the game. So there's a good possibility you might at some point choose to actually have someone who's not particularly good at the job in question be given the role anyway, just because you'd rather actually have someone who's super loyal, even if they're totally incompetent, just because the political influence is worth it. So this guy down over here, he's actually pretty good at his job, but right now we don't have any mercenaries hired, so we don't need 9% reduction in mercenary army maintenance, so uh, let's just actually get rid of him, uh, replace him with somebody nice and loyal. You'll do. You're much more loyal, even though you're completely bloody hopeless. So as a result of that, he jumps straight up to 98%. He's thrilled we've just given him a job, uh, and yes, indeed, uh, that means political influence starts going up. Now, in theory, if you were to have loyalty 100 people in every single role in your government, that'd be 0.25 per month each. 
So two a month is the absolute maximum you can get as a starting point. Though there may be texts down the line that boost that, I don't know. And obviously, yeah, avoid corruption as well, because corruption in your ruler will actually cause a reduction in that too. So you want to be staying away from corruption even more than you used to. Anyway, back to the mathematics here. As you're only gaining two a month, you're only gaining an absolute maximum of 24 a year. So it takes about four years, give or take, to gather together 100 points of political influence under pretty much the absolute best ideal scenario possible. And that is not very fast and not very much because uh, you need political influence for a lot these days. Want to change a law? That's going to be 35 political influence. Fancy changing a governor policy? That's going to be 15 political influence too. National ideas? Political influence. Government interactions? Some of them up to 100 political influence each. Sacrificing to the gods? Political influence. Diplomatic stance? Political influence. Fabricating a claim? Political influence. Improving opinion, political influence. And of course, the one that makes the most sense of all, provincial investments now cost political influence. A hundred each. So you may recall in my Pompey video, I said it was absolutely ludicrous on toast that you could spend a small amount of oratory in order to basically create one bonus local import route to your capital, and that just meant you could just keep doing that over and over again. So you should just keep doing that over and over again and end up with a ludicrous on toast number of capital surpluses. Yeah, I should stop saying these things out loud. I think Paradox might actually be listening. Yeah, that now costs 100 political influence to do. So even if you were to dedicate 100% of your political influence to doing exclusively that and nothing else, and as we've just covered, this currency does an awful bloody lot in the world, uh, yeah, you could only do it once every four years. So that's not really that viable anymore. And that's probably fair because that was ludicrously cheap in the Pompey update. So yeah, that's a fair update. But I do feel sad that we can't just keep spamming trade routes forever. It was good while it lasted, damn it. So as I say, there's no real chance you're going to be floating big old piles of political influence because you need it for just about flipping everything. So that stuff's going to be spent as soon as it comes in. So yeah, I think people are going to be a lot happier with that. That's a fun, interesting currency. If anything, maybe I'd say it should come from more sources than just your top eight government officials. It might be nice if, say, serving generals and admirals were contributing to that as well. So you need to try and keep those guys sweet. I don't know. It might need a little bit of work, but I need to play with this for a long time before I could come up with a truly informed opinion. But... I'll say, it's a fun, interesting system, and it does make picking government ministers a lot more of a balancing pros and cons situation. So again, just like military experience and to use or not use mercenaries, it's a big improvement, a big step in the right direction for making the game a lot more interesting. Now, the elimination of the currencies themselves probably feels like a really, really damn big thing, but... There's a lot more here too, and in many ways the important thing isn't the new currencies like political influence that are coming in to fill the gap, the important thing is what cascades downwards into the gameplay mechanics, and population in particular has had a rather major overhaul to it. So, the thing is, up to this point, there are way too many instances in Imperator of okay, my population is the wrong culture or the wrong religion, or they're not positioned as I'd like them to be. So, okay, spend currency, spend currency, spend currency, button, 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 button. Okay, I've pushed the button 10 times. The problem is now solved. And that's now totally gone along with the monarch powers. Now instead, societies just slowly shift in particular directions over time, and rather than just pushing buttons to just magic them into whatever state you want them to be in, instead, you just subtly nudge societies in the direction you want them to go, and they'll just slowly shift over time. So say hello to the new population screen, because up to now in Imperator, populations have mostly been pretty static unless you actively chose to move them around. So, you know, you could bring more people in, by enslaving people, you could promote people or assimilate them or convert them to your religion by spending the appropriate monarch power. But mostly for most of the time, populations were pretty static unless you took some form of action to move them, including, say, governor policies. Now that's actually changed. Even if you're not actively trying to make a change right now, there will be slow changes over time that are constantly happening in the background, where you can choose to try and speed it up or slow it down by passing the appropriate laws, going for the right governor policies, all of that good stuff. So say over here, in this little territory, we got a big pile of people who are not actually part of my primary culture group. 
So as a result of that, there is a possibility that at some point one of them will just start very slowly converting to my primary culture. Here we go, so if we just turn our attention over here, we've got a Boeotian who is actually in the process of being converted to our primary Sicilian culture because that's a thing that can just start happening in the background. And that's not just a question of culture, that can also just happen very slowly with religion, and also with social class. Some people will just start promoting quietly in the background over time. And on top of that, people will just start migrating as well. So here we go. Say back where I was just a second ago, what have we got going on here? So yeah, as is typical, we've got ourselves a new population just growing. So we've got ourselves, yeah, a new slave population coming in slowly over time. But we've also got migration occurring. So one of our populations is trying to leave this territory and head over to Liparai. Hang on, where's Liparai? Ah, yes, it's this tiny island up here. So these guys are just freely choosing to leave this society and move over here. Because they're free to do so, so why not? So in other words, there's a much more organic background process of people moving, assimilating, changing religion, slowly moving up in terms of social class. But with the monarch powers gone, you can't just start clicking to spend currency to make that happen instantaneously. Instead, you can just choose to speed up the process a little bit. So say if I wanted social mobility to significantly escalate inside this province, how would I do that? Here we go, some of the capital surpluses have changed. So these days, if I were to have a livestock surplus inside this province, then the pot promotion speed would go up by 5%. And the laws too have changed for this new system. So over in domestic laws, if I was to, yeah, relax citizenship status, as a result of that, again, the pop promotion speed would go up further. So people would be socially drawn upwards faster and faster and faster if I choose to set up the province and the national laws in the appropriate way. The big one, though, is the governor policy, social mobility. So yeah, pop promotion speed plus 13.5%, which is very, very big indeed. But again, you can't just click a button to turn a slave into a freeman or a freeman into a citizen anymore. Instead, all you can do is set up society so it will happen organically by itself as fast as possible. You can nudge it and encourage it, but you can't just spend magic abstract currency anymore to make it happen immediately. And of course, the same is true with the other forms of assimilation as well. So yeah, religious conversion is now just speeding up the rate of pop conversion by 13.5%, cultural assimilation by 13.5%. So if I just actually put us over to cultural assimilation there for a second, that Boeotian we were looking at a moment ago is now flying towards assimilation. So yeah, at this point he is actually gaining 9.5% towards assimilation every single month, though that would be higher if there weren't unrest. So yeah, yet more reason to get unrest nice and low as fast as possible, because unrest slows down assimilation, cultural conversion and social mobility. In terms of movement of people, however, there is one thing you are allowed to do, which is you can move around slaves because, you know, they're slaves, they're property. You can put them wherever you want. So you can move slaves from city to city, but you do actually have to pay for it these days in pure gold. Freemen and citizens, however, are understandably free peoples. They can go where they want, migrate where they want. You can try and encourage them to live in a particular environment, but you can't force them to do so. Instead, if you want your free peoples to move to a particular city, then you're going to have to make it enticing for them by adding to migration attraction. So migration attraction can be boosted by civilization value, for example, and available population capacity, which is still the same as it was following the changes made in Pompey. So here we are. The capital right now over here in Sicily can only have 34 pops in it. If I were to throw down a bunch of granaries, however, that would go up and up and up import more and more grain, that goes up and up and up, and as there's more spare capacity in the city, it becomes more desirable for people to come and live in it, presumably because empty space means like rents and property prices are low, so it's a good time to move in. I don't know, we can probably rationalise that nice and easily anyway. So I've just thrown down a couple of granaries, and yeah, alternatively, you can try and use civilization effort to boost the civilization level, making it more appealing, or you can use within the province, centralise or decentralise, and... Uh, yeah, I think the tooltips have slightly broken there, at least they're incredibly unclear. Centralised just basically means, hey, incentivize people to move from outside of the capital into the capital, decentralise in reverse. But yes, it doesn't actually say that anymore, it just says, yeah, completely the same thing on every row. They did warn us this might be on fire, okay, this is an extremely early version. Here we go, so I've built a couple of granaries over here in the capital, together with imposing the centralised governor policy, and now the migration attraction of the capital is plus 17.12, everywhere else 
is not so hot. They're still pretty decent, though. Apparently no one wants to live here. Ah, because this volcano just exploded. Yeah, volcanoes explode these days. That's what happened to this place. Everybody died. And here we go. All of a sudden, people are migrating en masse. Unfortunately, it's not telling me where they're migrating to, but I'm guessing they're migrating to the capital. But yeah, unfortunately, the new system seems to have slightly broken here, and they don't actually have a destination in mind. But I'm guessing all these people are migrating over here, because the migration attraction is currently huge, and there's plenty of space for them. And once again, I really like this new system, because now you're not just pressing a button to make everything how you want it to be. Instead, you're just nudging society, setting up laws and setting up policies to try and incentivize people to do what you want to do, whilst acknowledging, hey, free men are, you know, literally free men. You're not allowed to just move them around from point A to point B, or just point them and zap them with divine lightning that makes them change culture or religion. That's a process that takes time, and sure, you can encourage and incentivize, but you can't just magically fix everything. You know, unless they're slaves. Slaves can do what you want because, you know, they're slaves, but whatever. And while we're down here looking at the cities, you may have noticed, yeah, there's now a lot more buildings than there used to be. There used to just be four, now that's gone up to bloody 15. Though none of them have art yet. I'm sure they'll have art by the time we hit September and this actually launches properly. Now, some of these are very, very interesting indeed. Some are total garbage, but there are some really, really damn nice new ones. Now, first things first, even the ones that are returning aren't as bad as they used to be because they're a lot cheaper than they used to be. Base cost of 50, further reduced by your rule of finesse. So yeah, now a building only costs like 40 to 50 odd gold. That's actually much less of an investment. So it takes a lot less time to actually make its money back. And on top of that, some of the existing ones have actually been significantly boosted. Yeah, here we go. So a single marketplace now boosts commerce value by 33%, which is actually not so bad at all. So yeah, you're actually only spending 43 gold to boost commerce by 33 until the end of the game. That's actually a much better investment than it used to be. So yeah, the existing buildings are already a little bit on the better side. That's very, very nice indeed. But some of the new buildings, some of them are very, very interesting. And these two in particular are some of my favourites. So here we go. Each foundry increases the rate of shipping cohort recruitment speed together with the starting experience level. So if you were to stack, say, you know, five of them on top of each other, you're basically training things 50% faster, and they're also starting off with their experience bar already 25% full, which is not insignificant in the slightest. So if there was a single province where you did a lot of your training, yeah, slapping down foundries all over the shop might be a very, very interesting idea. Though I'll admit this might need a little bit of work and thought on how to make it fit together, because overwhelmingly, when I build armies, I do it by building to army within the army UI itself. And the thing about that is it doesn't give you a choice where you're actually building from. It just builds in the closest location. So on that occasion, it might well pick a city that doesn't have a foundry in it. Or if it does pick the city that has a foundry, it can only train one thing at once. So it won't actually queue them up there. It'll just start spreading them out and try and train them simultaneously. So either you have to build foundries all over the province where you're training your troops. Or you're going to have to accept that some troops are going to arrive sooner than others. And some of them are going to have the experience and some of them won't, which isn't great. Now, of course, you could use the macro builder to simply say, okay, train all of the archers at the one place that's got the foundry, but then they won't automatically move and join the army. So there might need to be a bit of work in how that actually fits together. I'm not sure about that one. But here's the big sexy one, the barracks. Because if you've played this game, then at some point you've probably been rather annoyed at the fact that any army of any significant size, in order to actually march anywhere, takes huge amount of attrition damage while within your own territory, just because an even remotely mid-sized army seems to always be passing the supply caps and there's not much you can do about it, no matter how many bloody vegetables you import into the territory. Well now, you can increase the supply limit 20% to go, and increase the local fort defence as well, which is pretty damn nice too, by building a single barracks. Five barracks on top of each other, you've just doubled the local supply limit. So I can definitely see myself tactically building them to create little highways of barracks to allow my army to march through my own territory. Say I was playing as Rome, say, I might actually want to have, say, yeah, 
barracks, 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 and at the same time, build roads for all the territories where the barracks are, because armies will naturally stick to roads because they want to go the fastest route possible. So yeah, building roads for your territory, and then just putting barracks along those roads so your troops don't actually take attrition while they're passing, that could definitely be something that's rather tactically useful. The rest of them are a bit more on the situational side, so yeah, citizen happiness now put up 2% to go, same for freemen, same for slaves. These two at the bottom, the theatre and the aqueduct, they're a bit on the interesting side, because then you can actually boost, yeah, pop assimilation speed or migration attraction. So if you build a ton of aqueducts, you make your city much more appealing for people to migrate into, which could definitely definitely be of interest. And of course you've got the same over here with academies and temples for pop conversion and pop promotion speed together with slightly boosting state religious happiness and research points up. So yeah that one doesn't exactly change the world but I will say the combination of lower price and a lot more variety and some interesting strategic opportunities in the buildings that is a good improvement I do rather like that. Ah yeah, so while we're just talking about things that used to be instantaneous and now take time to do, yeah, the new Fabricate Claim option. This is an interesting one, I'm not sure if there's a bit of an oversight in this. These days, you spend 10 political influence to begin fabricating a claim, but it's not instant anymore, and that's probably for the best, because it was always a bit silly that you could just slap down a claim and then a month later invade. That was definitely a bit on the odd side. Instead, that now begins a process. So here we go, having begun that process, we are now gaining 3.4% towards a fabricated claim every month. Base of two, and then ruler's charisma influences that, though of course there's a lot of text to help speed that up as well. So on this occasion, yeah, it's going to take like two and a half years to actually get that claim down. However, there is a bit of a way around that, but it's not available to republics. Just jumping ship to Sparta for a second, so sure, they couldn't actually try and fabricate a claim on their neighbour's Messenia over here, but as we've just established, that would take like two and a half years. So uh, how about we just use the new government interaction, Summon the War Council, which both monarchies and tribes have access to, because one, that doesn't actually cost anything to do, and two, that generates claims. Claims that are instantaneous and totally free. Now I suppose there is the downside that you don't know who your war council is going to recommend you go to war with. So they might actually go for someone else. And yeah, here we go. On this occasion, they haven't actually gone for Messenia at all. I've got two options, Argos and Megalopolis. Together with the fact that if you want to go for an option that only one person went for, you do end up with a net loss of loyalty because you only get bonus loyalty with the person you agree with. The people you disagree with, meanwhile, lose 20 loyalty each. So you are sacrificing a bit of loyalty. Regardless, it does feel a little bit on the generous side that, yeah, I can just basically say, okay, I'd like a claim on Megalopolis, please, and uh, it is immediately in place. So, uh, hang on, it's the beginning of the game, so I'm not allowed to declare war immediately, but I am allowed to declare war. There we go. Now I can declare war, and I've got a claim, so I can just go in and attack Megalopolis immediately. Meanwhile, Megalopolis can't actually attack me, because I believe Megalopolis is... Uh, you guys are a republic, right? No, you're a monarchy, actually. But if they were a republic, they'd have to wait, like, I don't know, two years or something to have a claim against me. So if they wanted to declare war, they'd basically have to do it without a Kausas Bella, which is not a very good idea. But I can attack them right at the beginning of the game. It just feels a little bit unfair that tribes and monarchies get to do that, but republics don't. Now, with all the monarch powers gone, you might well be wondering at this point, what's actually the point of your leader having stats anymore if everything they used to do has now been rolled into other systems? Well, I'm glad you asked, voice in my head, because actually, they've been rebalanced rather nicely. You see, back in the day, I always felt like Marshall and Zeal got a bit of a bad deal, all things considered. Finesse was absolutely crucial, because you always needed finesse to be unlocking new inventions in the technology tab, and Charisma and the Associated Oratory just seemed to be used for pretty much bloody everything. So those two were absolutely golden, but Marshall was really only used for hiring mercenaries and unlocking military traditions. So it wasn't used for that much really, and Zeal was kind of total garbage. Because even if you had fairly low Zeal, you'd always have plenty of religious power to get an omen out, boost ability up to plus three, and after that point... There wasn't really anything to do with zeal anymore, aside from occasionally going on a big splurge of just using divine lightning to convert entire countries to your religion. But these days, everything does something different, and it's a lot better than it used to be, in terms of every stat being roughly equivalently useful to each other, I'd say. So Marshall now does the extremely important job of managing manpower recovery speed in terms of how fast Freeman actually make it from your cities into your manpower, so that's very, very important indeed. 
and an army morale recovery. Also crucial, both in terms of armies recovering after a loss, but also, of course, in terms of units immediately after being trained, because I believe they start the game at only 50% loyalty, so if you've got a higher army morale recovery, newly trained units get up to 100% faster, they're ready to fight sooner. So those are both very, very crucial indeed. Finesse, meanwhile, reduces the cost of buildings. Not spectacular there, but I suspect buildings are a lot more useful than they used to be. So yeah, that might be better than I'm giving it credit. But more importantly, yeah, every point of finesse is worth 2% to national commerce income. Now, we'll get to commerce in just a second, because that's had a few amends too. But it's still a ridiculously big moneymaker that's still very, very useful indeed. Especially as finesse is now even more critical for governors, because the level of effectiveness of the governor policies is now a function of your finesse. Higher finesse governors can get more out of each of those policies. So just to give you an actual example, say, if the guy who is governor of this province right now had higher finesse, the rate of pop promotion speed would be boosted even further than the 13.5% on screen right now. And that is pretty crucial, by the way, because your leader will always by default be the governor of your capital province, which is the most important province of all. So that's a very important function of finesse too. Charisma's actually, weirdly, almost become arguably the least useful one of all, which is certainly a bit of a turn up for the books. Claim fabrication speed being a little bit up is fine, but as we've established, monarchies and tribes can kind of get around that one, and there are texts to boost that regardless. So it doesn't feel like a massive increase, to be honest. Meanwhile, monthly tyranny down 0.08 off a charisma of 8. That's not great either. And outside the republics, tyranny isn't exactly a major issue. It's probably one of the easier problems to deal with. So, uh, yeah, I'm not convinced charisma's actually that great anymore. From being the highest priority in the entire game, it's now arguably one of the less useful attributes. Zeal, however, oh zeal. Zeal has had quite a flipping turnaround from the least useful to maybe second most useful after finesse. You see, Zeal gets your monthly war exhaustion down, which might well be useful most of the time, though on the other hand, that might actually mean, yes, you actually want a Zeal Zero person in certain militaristic societies because you want war exhaustion to stay at least a little bit high just to actually speed up the rate of military tradition gains. That's certainly a bit on the interesting side. But here's the big one monthly stability change up. Remember, as per Pompey, stability is now on a sliding scale of between 0 and 100, where it trends back to 50 under all circumstances. But if you have a permanent plus to stability, basically, the higher zeal you've got, the higher your stability naturally comes to rest at. Just out of interest, I went and found a society that actually had someone with zeal 10 as a starting point. So yeah, we're just a little random tribe, a little bit north of Macedonia right there. And yeah, I just basically let time pass for a few years just to see at what level stability settled at if you've got yourself a zeal of 10. Now, it's only 55. I think that might need a little bit of balancing, by the way. I'd prefer to see, yeah, if you've actually got yourself a zeal of 10, it should be more like maybe 60-ish. So that means even if nothing good or bad is happening, your stability will just rest at this level. And as a result of that, growth is up a tiny bit, research points are up a tiny bit, commerce income's up a tiny bit, and the thresholds for triggering civil wars and rebellions are up a little bit too. Now, to be honest, that is a little bit on the modest side. Especially as a finesse of 7 gets you national commerce income up 14%. So yeah, zeal of 10 only getting you enough stability in order to justify another 2.6% national commerce income. It seems modest, but... Bear in mind, it's not just about where stability naturally rests, it's also about how quickly stability bounces back after you take a hit. Because you are going to be wanting to change laws all the time, probably more than you actually used to change laws, because these days, sometimes you're going to be wanting social mobility to be a thing, sometimes your priority is going to be on assimilation or religious conversion, so therefore, you're going to want to change the laws around a bit more often than back in Imperator 1.0. And whenever you do that, stability takes a knock. But if your resting point is at 55, a 15 knock only takes you down to 40. So therefore, it only takes 10 stability back up to get you to 50, which is the point where you're not suffering any negative effects whatsoever. And if you were to completely knack your stability by doing something stupid, like declaring war against literally everyone in the world in a row, say, there we flip and go, that just means your stability will spring back faster, because if it's resting points at 55, if you get it right down to the very lowest level, it'll want to spring back to that 55 as quickly as possible. And on the other hand, if events or sacrificing to the gods means temporarily you've got extremely high stability, if your natural resting point is a bit higher than it would be otherwise, it means your stability is going to drop a bit more slowly, so you can enjoy high stability a bit longer. It'll take me a bit of experimentation to figure out how I feel about that, and if I feel like, yeah, it should be a bit more generous, but 
it's certainly interesting and definitely better than it used to be. Now, two more things we need to cover. The first one's a bit on the subtle side, but I suspect actually could make a really, really big difference. Because one of the things I pointed out at the end of my Ellis Run Imperator was... The game was a bit too easy when it first came out. It was much too easy to keep people loyal, under control, and not really have any major internal problems. Well, there's been a couple of very small little tweaks that might help that quite a flipping lot. You see, aside from the new power base system, together with, yeah, the stability threshold system that I discussed in my Pompey video, making civil wars and rebellions a bit more on the likely side, uh, there's been a couple of new changes as well, uh, which is uh, generals get a lot more popular a whole lot faster. So yeah, back over here in Sicily, we're at a very early point in the game right now where most characters who aren't actually the king have got popularity of, yeah, 36%, 5%, 0%, 0.7, 4.9. Popularity for most characters is very low. This guy just basically went around with 4,000 horsemen riding down a couple of fleeing barbarians or whatever. His popularity is already up to 83.4%. And on top of that, now character seems to do a lot more scheming, he started investing in opportunities. So he's starting to actually, yeah, pick up wealth a lot faster than his wages would allow. So as a result, right now if we actually went to war, every single month there would be a 1.1% chance that any of his troops would go loyal to him. But if I was to actually put Drill Army on again, that goes up from 1.1 to 2.1. Currently reduced to 10% of that because we're actually at peace. And bear in mind, this is a guy who happens to have zero charisma whatsoever. So if he had a decent level of charisma, as the amount of money that he's possessing goes up, as his popularity ticks up and up and up, there is a good chance he'll have a decent number of cohorts become loyal to him very, very fast indeed. And these days, even if a cohort is loyal, you can break them down. It just costs twice the money. But the game doesn't forget they exist. They just get added to his power base. And in the event that he does decide to rebel at some point, they'll just basically teleport straight over to him and he'll just have a massive army of veterans to call upon immediately. Now in the old days it wasn't too difficult to manage loyalty. There were a whole bunch of tools at your disposal to do precisely that. But some of those have been attacked by Paradox as well. So wages, if you increase the wage, that used to give you a boost of 0.1 a month. That's now been halved to 0.05. So it's much more difficult to just throw money at characters to make them loyal these days. Of course, we could just bribe him, but then his personal worth goes up even further. And the chance of loyal cohorts goes up even more. And on top of that, you really, really, really don't want corruption on your leader these days. Because corruption on your leader directly converts into less political influence, which is arguably the single most important currency in the game, even more so than gold. So once again, I need to put a lot of hours into the game to actually see how all of that shook out over an extremely long campaign. But I suspect generals are going to be a lot more trouble than they used to be in Imperator 1.0. I suspect there's going to be a lot more popular generals with a lot more veteran troops loyal to them who are not so easy to buy off as they used to be. And one more thing as well, trade has actually had a bit of a rebalance. And to be honest, it desperately needs it. I was saying throughout my playthrough... Hey, encourage trade needs to be changed as a governor policy because right now it's all I do because why would I ever not be using encourage trade? Yeah, that has now lost the bonus plus one to trade route for the local province. It now just boosts province commerce that that is variable based on the finesse of the local governor. So yeah, that kind of needs to happen to be honest and is offset by the fact that yeah, the buildings for trade are now much better. Yeah, 33% of a single marketplace. That's actually pretty damn decent. I could potentially see myself having quite a few of them floating about. Instead, these days, if you actually want to have more trade routes, you need to actually entice business investments. But 100 political influence is an awful lot to ask for. And that certainly makes the civic ideas for boosting trade routes a lot more valuable than they used to be. I can definitely see a big advantage in them, absolutely. Though I will say, I think national ideas have been a little bit screwed over by this update in its current form. Because obviously, back in the old days, if you actually matched up the ideas to the sort of idea your society was supposed to have, then you got yourself, yeah, plus two to all of the different monarch powers. But these days, you don't get that anymore because there are no monarch powers. So instead, yeah, for Sicily, say, all you get if you actually match the ideas to the right type is tyranny down 0.1 and national citizen happiness up 10%. Which is kind of terrible, actually. It's really not worth bothering with. 
But there is one big question mark hanging over this screen I'm not able to answer for you, ladies and gentlemen, which is, uh, yeah, free state investments. Supposedly, various actions may grant you a free province investment, which may be used in place of influence to improve any of your provinces. Now, I don't know where they come from, presumably certain events, but yes indeed, if I were to have that, I would basically use it on enticed business investments all the time, because the other two are fine, but actually that one's not fine. That one's total garbage, never take religious endowments. Building slots plus one, that's kind of garbage too, and uh, provincial loyalty and population up 2%. That one's okay-ish, but basically nothing can possibly hold a candle to entice business investments. So uh, yeah, possibly the other provincial investments might need a bit of rebalancing, because right now business investments is just so much better than the others, it's just slightly ridiculous. And just a quick fire round of a final few little changes here. Supporting rebels these days actually directly increases aggressive expansion. That used to be, yeah, military power, but that's now gone, so that just directly boosts aggressive expansion instead. And speaking of aggressive expansion, that actually further slows down claim fabrication speed as well, to indicate, yeah, people are less likely to believe that piece of paper you're holding, saying, hey, I've totally got the right to invade your nation if you've just invaded 50 others on the same flimsy pretext. Accordingly, Devotios also don't cost military power anymore. Instead, those just boost your tyranny by plus three. And once again, don't just wipe out war exhaustion. They just make it tick down slowly over time. And speaking of tyranny, that now actually boosts pop assimilation speed too. So if you want to assimilate people into your empire nice and fast, a little bit of tyranny doesn't actually hurt. Aside, of course, from the fact it does hurt monthly general loyalty, monthly admiral loyalty. So again, another system where there are benefits and disadvantages to having something floating a bit on the high side. But then that was always true for tyranny, because tyranny always made your slave output go up a bit, which is still the case. So yeah, basically everything these days works a bit more like tyranny used to, which is very good, because tyranny was always one of my favourite systems for that reason. And a bit of an odd one for last as well, inventions these days, because civic power is no longer a thing, are simply handled with money. No, I'm not sure about this, because money in this game is not hard to come by. You are very often completely flipping swimming in money, so uh, I feel like it wouldn't be too difficult to basically take literally every invention. Whereas the old system, civic power is in such demand, uh, yeah, you had to carefully choose which inventions to take and which to leave be, because there was never enough civic power to take everything. But yeah, I kind of feel like on this occasion, it won't be too difficult for any empire to just take pretty much everything, because gold is pretty easy to come by. But then again, maybe that will be less the case, now trades had a bit of a rebalance, and you can't just use encourage trade to spam bonus trade routes literally everywhere. Possibly gold would be a little bit harder to come by. Still, that does feel a bit cheap to me. I suspect that might go up in price a little bit as time goes by, or maybe have a tiny amount of political influence tied to it. Like, not much, maybe just like, I don't know, 2, 2.5, something like that. It just feels a little bit cheap at the moment is all. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty much your lot. There's probably a bunch of little tiny changes I haven't got over here, but I've covered the big stuff, and uh, bloody hell, it is basically a completely different game. They have thrown out the absolute fundamentals around which the game was built and replaced them with new systems, and uh, I think it's a big improvement. And I also think in some ways it feels like, yeah, Imperator's moved a lot closer to Crusader Kings 2. It feels like there's been a big Crusader Kingsification going on here. A lot of the old systems tossed in the bin, a lot of the new systems. A lot more interesting, a lot more suited to roleplay, a lot more careful thought about pros and cons. A lot of systems where there aren't unqualified goods anymore. Instead, uh, there might be benefits, but also drawbacks to any decision you might make. This is interesting. This is very interesting indeed. I'm not jumping back into a new playthrough yet because, as you can see, this isn't even done yet. There's still art that's not actually been inserted into it. So, uh, plenty to do here. Plenty of rebalancing to do. But, big step in the right direction. Pompey was a modest but very welcome improvement. But this, this is the biggest complete redo of a game right down to its core elements I think I've ever seen. It blows Stellaris 2.0 and 2.2 out of the water in that regard. This has just completely changed how the game works, and uh, I'm fascinated. I need to have a dig through this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to put a bit of time into this, see how I feel about it, and see what changes they make. Because, yeah, there's going to be a bunch of hot fixes, changes, patches, balance tweaks as we go forward. But, yeah, Imperator, moving in the right direction. This is the second step of a four-step plan to get the game to where they really want it to be after the slightly troubled launch. So, uh, 1.3, the Livy update coming before the end of the year, and 1.4, Cassandra, 
I can't remember if that's beginning of next year or end of this one. I think it might be beginning of next year. But yeah, if this is what they're doing in 1.2, uh, bloody hell, I want to know what they're planning for 1.3 and 4. Because this game is starting to get somewhere. I like this game at launch. And uh, they are putting some big damn improvements into it. So, uh, let's leave things off for now. But... I'll be keeping a close eye on this because this is going in some very, very interesting directions. And I am very curious where it's going to end up. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been Many a True Nerd. And this has been Imperator Row with the Cicero Update. Thank you very much and goodbye. No, this no, this no, guy's no. enjoying that. This guy's enjoying his elephant a bit too much. Oh my god. In Fair Verona, we set our scene. Oh my god, Becky. Look at her butt. It is so big. They've managed to glitch inside one of the buildings. Elephants in the rear! And then oh, in come the chariots! Yeah.